Mark gets to introduce and tell us about our guest today. Mark. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Linda Attaway. She's here with the Mesquite Historical and Genealogical Society, and she's going to be talking to us today about Lafayette and Washington. Uh, uh, let's see, she's a um, and she's a board member of the Mesquite Historical and Genealogical Society. She serves as editor for the newsletter and now edits and writes genealogical travel articles for the Tree, which is their annual publication. She's also she has often created articles related to her family history research with trips to multiple states. She's made presentations to several genealogical societies in, the, the, in Texas, especially related to France. Uh, she was born in Dallas. Her family, she said, migrated all the way to Grand Prairie and then to Arlington, where she attended Arlington High School. She graduated from UNT with a BS in secondary teaching in English and a minor in French. She obtained an MS in French and teaching of French from Texas A&M Commerce. She retired from teaching several years ago after having taught 44 years in the Mesquite ISD. Uh, she, her claim to fame, she said, is that she taught Jerry, Jerry Hall, who, uh, for those of you who don't take People Magazine, was the uh, uh, former wife of Mick Jagger and it was married at one, yeah, and was at one time uh, married to, uh, Rupert, Rupert Murdoch, so, yeah, so, and she's seen her, I uh, think, had several chances to see her in the last few years. Uh, she's doing, busy doing now what she loves to do, creating genealogical research trips. She's soon going to Pennsylvania, she can tell you a little bit about that. And uh, she's a lover of French culture, so she'll get into some of that during her talk. Linda? Do I have any former students here? <laughs> Last year I spoke to the pilgrims and I asked that same question because I said my, I have ex-students everywhere after having taught 44 years and we all laughed. I was driving home admiring the beautiful homes uh, off of Northwest Highway. My window was down and I was just just uh, in awe and all of a sudden I heard Madame. And I looked over and there was a street crew. One of my ex-students was there. <laughs> and I just bl blurted out, are you behaving yourself? <laughs> he said, yes, yes. <laughs> Generals Washington and Lafayette side by side. I never intended to teach French. 44 years later, my time was up. I fell in love with France in the summer after my first year of teaching when I took a Relais et Chateau 21 day self-driving tour with a seasoned English teacher, slumbering in country inns, walking through a 13th century medieval cobblestone paved village where the evening air was perfumed with garlic, onions, and roasted poultry, passing through fields of lavender and sunflowers and exploring mountaintop castles, a life-changing voyage. Lost often, just like my friend's luggage, asking directions from a farmer inside the walls of a free-range chicken courtyard, are stuck in a dead-ended, tiny street and trying to back out, driving a stick shift with about 10 French people telling us what to do. Night falling on a country road with wheat fields surrounding, and we couldn't find out how to turn the lights on. Each mistake was an adventure. The Azure Coast greeted us with terrible pebble beaches, and I remember I was shocked to see homes on craggy mountains curb the Mediterranean, as well as topless bathers, some way too old. We ventured on north through central France, lodging in a former mill, the stream rushing below our window, digesting new gourmet dishes and local smelly French cheeses, 
and fresh baked crusty, crusty bread, a true movable feast. Three weeks later, departing Paris, I realized I left my heart in France. A new life. Upon my return, I became a Francophile. I traveled to France often and shared my images and stories with my students. I then tied my love of France and French with a new love of American history. When I traveled to Jefferson's Monticello and Yorktown and saw Lafayette's bedroom and the key to the Bastille at Mount Vernon. Then it all fit together when an aunt of mine announced that her genealogical line, my mother's line, and my line was French. A Harvard graduate and St. Louis lawyer grandson wrote, Frederick Loring was born in 1765. He came to the United States with Lafayette in 1781, was a bugler in the service under the Comte de Casse at the Battle of Yorktown. After the Revolutionary War, he settled in Philadelphia. He also took part in the War of 1812 under Major Clarkson and died at Los Angeles in California in 1856, age 91. Missing documentation of where he was born, his service with the cross, when exactly and where did he settle? That has been up to me, a work in progress. So now it's making sense, my love for France, all things French, and in class I shared excerpts about Lafayette after reading a book which jumped off the shelf at me at my school library, where he was imprisoned with rats as his, as his bedfellows and was only able to write with to toothpicks and soot as ink in the columns of books. I am shocked when I look in an American history book or an index about the American Revolution and there is maybe one sentence about him. In class we learned the Marseillaise. How does that go? Da, da, dun, da, da, da. We learned about famous French historical characters and places and I would often say, imagine what if we love history when we can imagine and visualize how people lived. I began wondering about Lafayette's life. So what aspect of his life should I study? His noble family heritage of service going back to the Middle Ages and Joan of Arc? The dreary family castle history in Auvergne in South Central France? with walls covered with paintings of ancient soldier ancestors and nobles, his early orphaned life and inheritance, which left him one of the richest nobles in France. The marriage of convenience approved by the French king, Louis XV, which turned into a love story. His three surviving children, the door of opportunity getting slammed in his face upon arrival in Philadelphia, his spending half his fortune in the colonies, his staying at Valley Forge in the winter, his obtaining aid from the new French King Louis XVI for the American Revolution, his contributions at Yorktown, his motto, Cour Non, which means why not, his subsequent, subsequent involvement in the French Revolution, and repercussions from the terror, the beheading of his wife's grandmother, mother, and sister his wife's own two-year imprisonment, and then life with Lafayette in a stench-filled prison, his one-time attempt at escaping imprisonment during a carriage ride aided by the American son who was a medical student in Europe of the first plantation owner Lafayette happened to arrive at, Napoleon's banishing him from Paris. I could just go on and on and on. My decision was made. I wondered mostly how, what was the inspiration to take up the freedom banner for the colonies and how did he do it? I also wanted to discover exactly when he met Washington and the story of the miracle of their friendship. I created a timeline and began my exploration. Among many books and videos I viewed, I found the answers in a book 
adopted son, Washington Lafayette, and the friendship that saved the revolution by David A. Clary. Now let's first compare their biographies. Those of you who are sitting at the back of the class might have trouble seeing this. <laughs> Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roch Gilbert du Mortier, the Marquis de Lafayette, was born in 1751, and he was about two when his father was killed by a cannon shot uh, fired in the, uh, by the English in the French and Indian War at the Battle of Minden. The English soldier Phillips, who possibly fired the cannon, would later be killed by Lafayette's troops in our revolution. Lafayette's rich, widowed, noble mother, Marie-Louise Jolie de la Riviere, soon left for Paris to live at the Luxembourg Palace in order to begin creating a cigree for her, her son to enter into noble society. She left Lafayette's citizen-loving grandmother in charge Sadly, his mother died in Paris when she was 33 and Lafayette was 13. So now he had lost both parents. His paternal grandfather died soon after and he inherited millions in property. George's father, Augustine Washington, descended from an English wool merchant who was a mayor of Northampton and Henry VIII gave him to reign at Sulgrave, England. Immigrant John Washington arrived in 1657 in Virginia and was a member of the House of Burgess. His grandson, Augustine, was the father of our George, who married first Jane Butler, and they had three children, including Lawrence, later a mentor to his half-brother, George. After Augustine's first wife, Jane, died, he married Mary Ball, and George was the firstborn of five surviving children. George's father, Augustine, died when George was about 11. George's mother, Mary Ball Washington, has been described as difficult, demanding, and selfish, or was she just a widow woman working hard for her five children? Mary Ball did not come from noble stock, but she inherited about a thousand acres after she had lost her father, Joseph Ball, when she was three. Mary's mother died when Mary was 11. Upon advice of an from an uncle, Mary Ball Washington refused to allow 14-year-old George to sign up with the cruel English Navy. Mary Ball Washington and her, child and, uh, and her children lived at one of the farms and would later move to Fredericksburg, Virginia in a home that George bought for her. She troubled George when she asked for money, and she died shortly after George went to see her before he came, became president. Lafayette was raised in an old family castle of Chavagnac in the country in central south area called Auvergne, which is topped with ancient volcanoes, and he was taught by his grandmother to respect the peasants in the village. In his damp castle, Lafayette had a tutor who taught him to speak Latin, and at age 11, he went to Paris to an exclusive school. He didn't like Paris and Versailles and the courtly manners. At the age of 14, a year after his mother died, Lafayette enrolled in the king's elite corps, the Black Musketeer, and moved into the Noailles mansion in Paris, headed by the powerful Duke Diane. Actually, the future American general had been picked early on to marry the Duke's second daughter, Marie-Adrienne Françoise de Noailles. George was raised on several farms near the Potomac, then at the age of seven moved to the Rappahannock River at Ferry Farm. George went to school and learned reading, arithmetic, and handwriting. He copied social rules whereas his older two half-brothers, Lawrence and Augustine Jr., had been educated in London. However, Lawrence, who became a mentor for George, 
made good connections by marrying the right person, which coincidentally helped create a career for George. The father of our country became a skilled surveyor for his half-brother Lawrence's rich father-in-law, Lord Fairfax, owner of five million acres in the Northern Neck. Sadly, Lawrence, who inherited the land he named Mount Vernon of 2,500 acres, died of tuberculosis when George was about 20. Lawrence's wife, Anne Fairfax Washington, inherited the land and remarried after six months. And George first rented Mount Vernon from her and eventually inherited the terrain. George was an excellent horseman. Lafayette, at first, lacked skill and grace on a horse. George loved to dance. Queen Anne Marie Antoinette laughed at Lafayette's skill, lack of skill and grace, and the court of Versailles followed her laughter. George had a noblesse of character, and Lafayette had to be taught how to have noblesse oblige. What about their love lives? George married a widow, Martha Custis, after having met her possibly three times. And she was perhaps the richest widow in Virginia, who had two surviving children out of four. The surveyor George had asked 16-year-old flirty Betsy Fontelroy for her hand twice, but he was refused. George possibly loved Mrs. Sally Carey Fairfax his whole life. And here I have the secret love. One problem, she was his best friend's wife. Sally Carey, who married George William Fairfax, son of the millionaire Lord Fairfax, whom she met at a governor's ball at Williamsburg, was a man as socially prominent as she was. Sally became the mistress of the nearby Belvoir Mansion, and she taught her husband's friend, George Washington, about culture and proper society manners. Sally Carey Fairfax and her husband, George William, moved to London, where he lost all his money, died, and Sally moved to Bath, where she died, even though her dear friend, George Washington, had asked her to move back to Virginia. Marriage for Lafayette was arranged before he knew anything about it. And his future wife, Adrienne de Noailles, was the last to find out, although she was not displeased. The arranged marriage was first created by lots of legal papers, which included the old King Louis XV's approval. At the wedding feast, the young couple, he aged 16 and she 14, could not consummate their marriage because of parental compliance. And it finally happened one evening when Lafayette secretly entered her room six months later. Lafayette had several affairs before and during their marriage, which his wife tolerated. She stayed in love with him her whole life until her end in 1807. And Lafayette carried a locket with her picture after her death. Did they both escape an early death? Yes, George outlived a shot in his hat and four shots in his jacket and the death of two horses, all during one battle in 1755 near Fort Duquesne in the French and Indian War. Lafayette, in his first battle of Brandywine, was shot in the calf, but was rallying the troops, don't retreat, don't retreat, stay here. And he didn't even realize that he had been shot. He was taken to the Moravian settlement of Bethlehem, and George told the doctor, take care of him as if he were my son. Lafayette, the schemer, too young, too idealistic, too bored, or too rich to be deterred. I do believe that at an officer's dinner at the Count of Broglie in Metz, Lorraine, France, December 1775, was the most incredible, remarkable, and history-changing repast when the young soldier Lafayette met the English King Cornwallis's brother, the Duke of Gloucester. The Duke, upset at his brother, King Cornwallis, for lack of approval of the Duke's wife, sympathetically discussed what the patriots were doing in the colonies. 
This ignited a spark in Lafayette that would eventually change world history. The officer without a war and off of commission decided to come to the colony's aid. He kept this a secret from his pregnant wife and his controlling father-in-law, the Duke. The boy who had never seen combat secretly signed up in Paris in 1776 with recruiter Silas Dean, an American representative for secret correspondence, as many other French soldiers had done to fight. The 19-year-old expected to volunteer as the rank of Major General. What the boy didn't know and maybe never found out was there was a secret scheme hidden from England who was at peace with France to funnel French money to the American rebels. This included the King Louis XVI, his foreign minister, Vergen, American Silas Dean, and the commander, the Count of Broglie, who wanted to replace Washington with himself. In addition, an old friend, DeCab, from military school, who would later die on our soil. And even the famous composer of the Barber of Seville, Beaumarchais, were in the deal. The first part of the plot failed in northern France at Le Havre. Three boats were loaded with supplies and ready to depart for the colonies. But French military officers sent bragging letters home, and even the disguised organizer, Beaumarchais, attended a produ production of his opera and then took a bow, disguise off, and exposed part of the plot to save face and prevent a war with England, even though one boat had already left. The French king's foreign minister then forbade any French soldiers to leave France. So Lafayette, unaware of the real plot, did what any millionaire would do and offered to buy a boat. His first voyage and arrival. The boat found in Bordeaux needed to be outfitted. So what does the king's musketeer do? He needed to pass some time. He took a trip to London, where he met King George III, thanks to his wife's uncle, who was the ambassador from France to England. After three weeks of connections, introductions, and entertainment, the young Marquis skipped out on a ball that was to be in his honor and went back to Paris to his partner de Cab's home. Not to his home, though. And he wrote a letter to his pregnant wife and to his father-in-law and then hurried to Bordeaux. The disguised dreamer sneaked southwest near the coast to Bordeaux to board his boat, which he had fitted with two cannons and filled with provisions, which he named Victoire. When the French King Louis XVI and Lafayette's millionaire father-in-law discovered the plot, the king's soldiers fled following in Lafayette's pathway. He was told that the king had written a lettre de cachet for Lafayette, offering imprisonment if he didn't return to Bordeaux and then east to Marseille. The victoire headed south on the coast, crossed the French border for a small Spanish port of Los Pasajes. As the swashbuckler began doubting his decision on April 1st, no fool, 1777, he left the boat docked on the Spanish coast and traveled north by coach for three days into France back to Bordeaux to ask forgiveness from the king and his family as well as to his wife. And he waited and started thinking he and he feigned compliance. He pretended to follow the orders to take a coach east to Marseille. But at the stable to exchange horses, the French Zorro took a disguise, purchased a horse, and rode south for three days, sleeping in stables, gendarme in hot pursuit, and arrived safely back to his Spanish port and his victoire. Here again I say, what if? The brazen nobleman had charmed an innkeeper's daughter in France to not tell anyone where he was, and it worked. About April 26, 1777, it happened, the departure. 14 officers and a crew of 30. The crossing kept the starry-eyed adventurer sick for weeks. After almost two weeks, the 19-year-old filled his days 
with English lessons and reading and writing, whereas passengers stayed in small, damp, dark cabins decorated with mold, living on rations, and surviving sometimes rough weather. The boat approached Charleston, South Carolina, June 13th after six weeks on water. But the secret sailors were warned by sailors on an American vessel to continue north to evade the English blockades. Some 60 miles later, at the North Island and entrance to Georgetown Bay, the anchor dropped. Lafayette, his friend the cab, and four French officers were rowed in a small boat to find help. It was about 2.30 p.m. About 10 p.m., remember they were some 60 miles north of Charleston, they discovered some slaves who were digging for oysters. As the cab explained in English with a German accent that they were French officers, they were taken to Major Eager, the rice plantation owner's home by midnight. Welcomed, they were fed and bedded down. The officers were advised to return south to Charleston using three of the Major's horses, and Major Huger would have the Victoire piloted south. Lafayette, intrigued at every moment in this enticing, exotic land, tasting cornbread and sweet potatoes for the very first time, while the officers complained of hot sands, thick woods, and only having three horses. The optimist in a supposed Shangri-La arrived in Charleston after 70 miles and three days later, looking like beggars and barefoot. Luckily, Lafayette uh, proved he was a Mason, and he was greeted by Brother Masons. Upon arrival of the Victoire the following day, a new reverence was given. After a week's long festivities in Charleston, Lafayette DeCab and five officers began a 32-day, 800-mile trip north to Philadelphia in newly purchased carriages, which had turned to splinters by the fourth day. The trip included use of horses who survived, which survived, and challenged the Frenchmen when walking on foot through swamps and over bad roads, sleeping in the woods, fighting off fever, dysentery, hunger, and reposing in horrible lodgings. Rich soldiers who unloaded most of their baggage. Yet Lafayette wrote, vast forest, immense rivers. Nature adorns everything in the land with an energy of youth and majesty. The victoire had it easier but not so victorious left back for France and sank. So Lafayette collected insurance, which helped pay his note. Changing boats in Annapolis July 17th, they arrived in Philadelphia July 27th. Cleaned up a bit. The next day they knocked at the Pennsylvania State House in Philadelphia where Congress convened and were turned away. What if? After the trip from hell, since the letters from Franklin and Silas Dean had not even been opened by Congress, and they were sick of French volunteers wanting money and military titles, and they didn't know Lafayette, who was waiting his glory. Lafayette quickly sent a letter to, uh, sent a letter and volunteered to serve without pay, but wanted to be a major general. Congress receiving the letter as well as opening the envelope with the recommendations from Silas Dean and Benjamin Franklin welcomed the young 19-year-old millionaire. When exactly did Lafayette meet Washington? A couple of days later, August 5th, Lafayette was invited to a dinner hosted at the City Tavern, now a reconstructed historic-themed restaurant to fit the troubled George Washington. Washington was at one end of the table and Lafayette brought by delegates at the other end. The 19-year-old skinny overwhelmed Lafayette, said later, the majesty of his figure and his height were unmistakable. Washington said later, the boy was worthy of esteem and attachment. 
the young redhead, six foot tall, made his way to meet the six foot two general and told him, I am here to learn. Lafayette was invited to see the troops the next day. In Lafayette's own words, in third person, Washington took Lafayette aside, spoke to him very kindly, complimented him upon the American cause, and then told him that he should be pleased if he would make the quarters of his commander-in-chief his home and consider himself at all times one of his family. Washington had been informed of Lafayette's contacts with the French king and must have been impressed with the story of his voyage. Here was an instant son for George, and here was the new father that Lafayette never knew. This was destiny. What really proved to Washington that Lafayette could be trusted? There were several plots to replace Washington. The Conway Cabal failed to remove George from command of the Continental Army. In the winter of 1778, when Conway tried to enlist Lafayette against Washington, Lafayette added, and a toast to General Washington. Washington had his own spies, including a slave, James Armistead, who became a soldier with Lafayette. Lafayette returned to France after two years here to obtain aid from the French king, Louis XVI. He just had a short house arrest for punishment. And within a week, within a week in his father's mansion, time was spent making connections and rallying the French for aid, and it worked his second voyage here. Successful, the young general returned to the colonies in 1780 on the king's ship, the Hermione, which is pictured here. Lafayette announced in Morristown to George that there would be 6,000 soldiers, six ships, and supplies coming. George teared up when he received the news. And the rest is history at Yorktown, where Lafayette was the interpreter between George and Rochambeau and de Grasse. And all we read in history books is that Lafayette helped in the American Revolution. The third voyage for Lafayette. He was invited back for a four-month farewell tour in 1784. Reunited with old friends on the route, including the spy and freed slave with a new name, George Armistead Lafayette, whom Lafayette immediately recognized and stopped his triumphal carriage to descend and embrace him. Visits to New York, Philadelphia, Alexandria, Baltimore, Hartford, Boston, Richmond, and Annapolis compensated the hero and fed his ego. On December 1, 1784, after a 10-day visit at Mount Vernon, Washington's carriage followed his adopted son to Marlboro, where they hugged, tears rolled down their faces, and they separated. Later, the final farewell letter written by Washington, in the moment of our separation upon the road, as I traveled in every hour since, I felt all that love and respect and attachment for you with which lengths of years, close connections, and your merits have inspired me. George asked, would this be the last time we see each other? Lafayette thought, and though I wish to say no, my fears answered yes. He answered, no, my beloved general, our late parting was not by any means a last interview. Adieu, adieu, my dear general. It is with inexpressible pain that I feel I'm going to be severed from you by the Atlantic. Everything that admiration, respect, gratitude, friendship, and filial love can inspire is combined in my affectionate heart to devote me most tenderly to you. In your friendship, I find a delight which words cannot express. Lafayette wrote, Adieu, my dear general, it's not without emotion that I write this word, although I know I shall soon visit you again. Be attentive to your health. Let me hear from you every month. Adieu, adieu. This would be their last meeting. Back at Mount Vernon, George wept openly at the dinner table whenever he talked about his love for Lafayette. His dear adopted son, 
who abhorred slavery, influenced George, who wrote in his will that he freed his slaves upon the death of his wife. Sadly, George died in 1799, not knowing if Lafayette was free to cross the Atlantic. Lafayette returned to France hoping to create a new democratic government, wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man with help from Jefferson, joined the National Guard, and then was accused of treason. France was at war with Austria. Lafayette was captured in Belgium to be eventually imprisoned during the Reign of Terror for five years. His wife, imprisoned in Paris for almost two years, visited James Monroe and his visited by James Monroe and his wife, was released, freed with passports for her and her two daughters to America. But she joined the valiant Lafayette, now clothed in, clothed in rags, skin, and bones, in a filthy rodent and insect-ridden prison at Omuls. She suffered the rest of her life from illness contracted there. Their son, George Washington Lafayette, and his tutor escaped death with arranged passports by James Monroe. They would finally stay at Mount Vernon. In 1797, thanks to American officials, the Marquis, his wife, and two daughters were released and exiled to Denmark, finally to go home to La Grange Castle, east of Paris, thanks in part to Napoleon. Lafayette's wife had become the strength in the family and had used her clout. In 1814, Lafayette was elected to the National Assembly. Lafayette's fourth and final voyage in 1824. In all, Lafayette made eight Atlantic crossings. His last one month long sea voyage anchored at the New York Harbor, where he was welcomed by tens of thousands of grateful Americans. He was the last living general of George Washington. His last triumphal visit, 1824-1825, to 24 states, traveling 5,000 miles, a planned four-month visit stretched into 13 months, studded with thousands of admirers, old soldiers sporting now ragged uniforms that Lafayette had purchased, good friends embellished with parades, balls, music, souvenirs, and receptions. This tour often left his eyes overflowing with tears, especially when Lafayette descended alone to George's vault at Mount Vernon, and a few minutes thereafter reappeared to take his only son, George Washington Lafayette, and his recording secretary, Le Vasseur, by the hand and led them into the tomb where George lay since 1799. They knelt reverently near his coffin and all wept. The aging general visited Monticello several times where he conversed in French. Jefferson had to replenish his collection of red wine after Lafayette left. And he said a last goodbye to James and Dolly Madison, walked the grounds at Yorktown, and laid a cornerstone at Bunker Hill and collected dirt as a souvenir. He was given a ship called Brandywine to return home. The author of three autobiographies died in 1834 from pneumonia in Paris, and all our Congress mourned for a month. Black drapes adorned the congressional chambers. John Quincy Adams delivered the funeral oration. On Lafayette's tomb in Picpus Paris Cemetery, his son, George Washington Lafayette, added soil brought from the battlefield of Bunker Hill. The French government, not as enamored as the Americans, only allowed a small military funeral. An American flag stands day and night over Lafayette's grave, and every July 4th there is an honor tribute, and the Star Spangled Banner and the Marseillaise are played. In 1917, one of Pershing's soldiers, Colonel Charles E. Stanton, upon arriving in France, visited Lafayette's grave and said, Lafayette, nous voici. Lafayette, here we are. A treasure trove of family history from the 1400s was found by descendants in 1956, hidden behind walls in many rooms of Lafayette's wife's castle of La Grange, 
where Lafayette lived from 1802 to 1834. The organized collection was microfilmed in 1996 in the only room with electricity, the kitchen. Lafayette's ship from his 1780 second voyage here, when he announced the support from France, the Hermion, was rebuilt using confiscated English drawings at a cost of $27 million and 17 years work and returned heroically to our shores, first in New York in 2015. A friend, a member of the DAR, just gave me the July-August 2019 DAR magazine, The American Spirit. And it has a cover of, a paint, of the painting of Lafayette and a major article called the Lafayette Trail. Frenchman Julien Isher, founder and executor, executive director of the Lafayette Trail, is recreating Lafayette's farewell tour from 1824-25 for the bicentennial celebration of 2025. Lafayette's emotional response from President Adams at the White House at the conclusion of his tour is included in this article. God bless the American people, each of their states, and the federal government. Accept this patriotic farewell of an overflowing art. Such will be the last thought when it ceases to beat. So a 17-year-old taught me, people die twice once when their physical body leaves and the second time when their name is never spoken. So I say, Lafayette, nous voici, here we are. Let all American towns, buildings, parks, schools, universities, counties, statues, and people named after you always remember you, your miraculous daring voyages of inspiration and difficulty, your contacts with France and its powerful nobles, and your lasting friendship with our first president and your victory at Yorktown. Live in the memory of every American and let there be more than one sentence written about you in our history. Vive la France! Vive l'Amérique! Merci beaucoup! Very well. Merci. Linda, that was excellent, and I think, I think you have filled in some of the blanks for us. <laughs> yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Step right over here, mm -hmm. please. Okay. Yeah, would like to. Uh, <coughs> first of all, we'd like to present you a certificate of appreciation for your excellent research and your presentation, thank you. Thank and as well as an SAR mug. Excellent. So, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Open the sheet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know how you get that much enthusiasm on a Saturday morning, but thank you. Thank you. Interesting to note, as I consider myself a semi-historian, I did find out something this morning in your talk that I was unaware of. I knew about the presence of Lafayette and his battles. But my patriot ancestor, Jacob Van Fossen, also fought at Brandywine. So I can now tell people he fought with Lafayette. Good. I like that. Very good. <laughs> 